good to see everybody this afternoon. Thanks for coming to our first 2020 Brown Bag Luncheon. I told Paul when I started this job that I had recently come from an organization that you'll hear a little bit more about called the Pollinator Partnership. And I knew that DPR worked a lot on pollinator related issues in terms of the regulatory uh, work that we do. And so I'm really glad that we're able to pull this uh, brown bag luncheon together. And my hope is that it will be the first in a series of brown bags that we can do over the course of this calendar year on various other important policy issues. So it's great to see everybody here today. You'll hear a lot more about things that you can do to help pollinators, both honeybees, which are managed pollinators, and the many thousands of species of native bees uh, from Kelly, I suspect. But I just wanted to give you a sense of the importance of pollinators to our economy and to our, to our world, really. Pollinators are a keystone species, which means that without that keystone species, you lose a lot of biodiversity and the world around us would be dramatically different. So it's really important that we do everything that we can to support pollinator health in our backyards, in our farms, and in our fields around the country. And indeed, fully one third of the, of the food produced in North America comes to us as the result of a pollinator. Most, in most cases, it's honeybees, but native bees play a really important role in pollinating our food, as do butterflies and birds and even bats, like the Mexican fruit bat. It amounts to about $220 billion a year in terms of the overall contribution that pollinators play in our global agricultural economy. But pollinators are in danger, and there are a number of reasons why that is the case. Uh, certainly pesticide overuse in some cases contributes to pollinator declines, but there's also a, a parasite known as the varroa mite that some of you are familiar with that also plays an important role, the pathogens that those pe parasites carry, and the biggest perhaps is a loss of pasture or habitat for our bees, managed and native. So there are lots of things that are uh, really attacking the health and viability of pollinators here in this country and elsewhere in the world. And there are many things that you can do to promote pollinator health. You can start with a backyard garden, you can support local farmers, you can support the work of groups like the Pollinator Partnership and Xerces Society and many others that really spend a lot of time focused on what they can do organizationally to support pollinators. But there are also lots of things that you'll hear from Peggy and Patricia and Tim from on uh, the things that local and state government are doing. There are also lots of things happening at the federal level and at some point we'll get a federal representative as well. Are we getting all of our doors open back there? So without further ado, let me introduce the first panelist that you'll hear from. She is my colleague at DPR, and her name is Peggy Byerly. Peggy is a senior environmental scientist with the enforcement branch of DPR, and she's been with the department since 2001. She worked for the Ag Commissioner in LA County and also worked for San Joaquin County, earned her bachelor's degree in fruit industries agriculture, didn't know there was such a degree, from Cal Poly Pomona. So please welcome Peggy Byerly. Thank you, Val. Thank you all for coming and sharing this time with us. Part of my talk today is to give a very brief overview of a very big program. And also at the end to give you some final thoughts about how every one of us, within the sound of my voice and those you speak to, have a role to play in pollinator protection in California. Protecting bees, industry and regulators already know, is not a new concern in California, but it is an evolving and expanding one. Most of my talk today is about protecting managed bees in terms of pesticide applications because that's the foundation of DPR's jurisdiction in California. But first, one of my favorite things, know the history. So here is a very quick run through of some key events in California pollinator protection. California's bee protection history, formally and informally, began over 45 years ago. As you can see from this slide, in 1974, the commissioner in Tulare, one of the three uh, nicknamed Citrus Bee Protection Area counties now, Tulare, Kern, and Fresno, 
That commissioner realized that the practice of beekeepers uh, having hives near citrus groves was causing some inadvertent bee kills. And so the purpose of the meetings that started in 1974 with the local stakeholders and surrounding ag commissioners was to work out how the citrus growers could continue to protect and produce their crops and the commercial beekeepers could drop their hives to produce the citrus honey that so many of us love without substantial bee loss. These talks went beyond 1974 and ended up resulting years later in some of the California laws and regulations the DPR and CDFA enforce through the Ag Commissioners today. As you can see, during our history, the communication between the stakeholders has been absolutely vital and continues to have the relevance today, in some ways even more. Some of the aspects of concern back then that we know are still very critical today. To communicate about the pesticide applications, the timing and location of the applications, and notifying the beekeepers in the area so that these commercial beekeepers are aware and can make their decisions on how to protect their bees during these applications. As Val said, there's also some things going on at the federal level. One of them that we regulators and industry are already quite familiar with, in 2013, when federal EPA started asking for what we now call the bee box to be included on pesticides that EPA designated as toxic to bees, to have specific additional use restrictions and advisory recommendations. Some of the aspects on the bee box specifically that uh, can make the applicators aware, avoiding direct contact with bees during applications. What's always been a concern, do not drift off-site outside of the target spray area. Some labels in the bee box and on the labeling also include some residual toxicity information for those where the potential for bee exposure goes past the application period itself and talks about the adult foraging bee concerns or sometimes the uh, concern about what they might be carrying back to the hives. EPA asked states in recent years to develop and make accessible online what is now referred to as the MP3, the Managed Pollinator Protection Plan. This is ours and one of the links that you will be able to access it afterward if you are, have not been aware of it in the past. For the MP3, the primary goal is to give an overview and some information, not only to the regulated industry stakeholders locally, but also to the public. The primary goal is to bring awareness and ensure growers, applicators, beekeepers, and any other concerned stakeholders help continue their part in producing our food and fiber and protecting bees in areas beyond just commercial agriculture, but that allows beekeeping in California as well as production agriculture to continue to thrive. These are just a few of the BMP examples to result when followed in the reduced risk for not only the managed or commercial bees, but also the secondary benefit to native pollinators. One of the things you see highlighted in this slide, protection of the pollinators begins before the bees are dropped at the site. And I'll go into a little more in the subsequent slide about that. But then there's always some vegetables with every presentation, and these are mine. The regulatory tools, which will also include the links for those who want to uh, research this online more. 
The Apiary Protection Act, which is Division 13 of California's Food and Agriculture Code. There are some code sections in Division 13 that have recently been updated in the last two years. These, of course, are enforced locally by the county ag commissioners. And in Division 13, most of the code sections are primarily under CDFA jurisdiction. Commercial beekeepers must register in each county where they drop or where they keep their bees. Notify the ag commissioner because a number of these contract managed pollinator groups come from out of state during certain seasons for certain crops. When the bees are moved from locations within the county now, and of course when the bees leave the county. The new section 2913 will give additional enforcement tool of civil penalty authority starting in January of next year for certain violations listed that occur in Division 13. This slide I put together just to highlight that phrase, it takes a village. Because this interconnectedness in this slide says so much to us all. County Ag Commissioners, the primary enforcement agents for label compliance for applications and other pesticide and laws and regs. DPR oversees activities related to pesticides. And DPR also does outreach to industry and to training to the county ag departments. CDFA oversees other aspects, beekeeper registration, colony health inspections, border station inspections of incoming bees. Our next speaker, Patricia, will be going into more about their program. Uh, industry groups such as the California Almond Board represent, do outreach, and provide best management practices related to their crops. Beekeepers register their bees, notify the commissioner of the hive locations, request notification of pesticide applications within a one mile radius of where their bees are located. Growers communicate with the beekeepers starting with the history of recent applications before the bees actually arrive. That can give maximum pollinator protection for these bees, knowing what was there in the days right before. Pest control operators follow the best management practices in their recommendations for pesticide applications and communicate site-specific details to the growers and applicators treating those crops. The applicators themselves not only follow the labeling and permit conditions from the county ag, but are aware of all of this when they spray. There are a number of new online links and others that are updated periodically. The online uh, tools now include Beware California that just came into being online last year. They can be accessed by beekeepers inside or outside of California by such uh, sites as the CalAg permits or Field Watch. The pest control advisors have their part of beware to see where the bees are located within a mile radius of where a proposed application to a crop is going to occur. The applicators can use beware to see how many beekeepers are located within that one mile radius of the proposed application. And then the county ag, of course, use Beware to help them monitor for compliance. The Beware website lists a total of 17, including several regulatory and the rest industry entities as being sponsors and or collaborators in the Beware site and development prior to 2019. And now, a take home point that I hope everyone within the sound of my voice will ponder. Every one of us talks to people, communicates with people through our jobs, anywhere we go, family parties and events. There are more applications going on than just crops in California. Backyard spraying, 
other what we call non-agricultural sites. Knowing that the pesticide label has these instructions and must be followed for pollinator protection and for a number of other reasons we don't have time to go into today. Spread the word. Help us to be aware. If you are doing something in your own backyard and you see bees flying around, be aware and spray carefully so that you're not contaminating those foraging bees. In a small way, in a big way, we all play that part and we need your help going forward in pollinator protection. And as I said, online we've got the link to the MP3 as well as way more on our pollinator DPR page than we can show in a slide. We also have a number of links here. As Paul said, there's a handout and it'll be posted so that uh, those of you who want to research for more information can easily access these links. Also, DPR periodically updates regulations. In this case, one of the things that will be coming up for us within the next year, the Citrus Bee Regulations and Title III will be doing some code changes to update and modernize for communication options that were not available to the regulated industry 10, 20 years ago. So you can monitor our website later on this year at the appropriate time. Most of all, for those of you who are within the sound of my voice, we thank you all for your interest in your activities in presenting, um, as our other presenters will, and presenting elsewhere, formally or informally, in what you do. Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart for your contributions, past, present, and future in protecting pollinators in California. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Peggy, thank you very much. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Patricia Bowles from the Department of Food and Agriculture, where she is an environmental scientist with CDFA's Be Safe program. Uh, prior to her work with the state, she was an adjunct professor at Napa Valley College and Diablo Valley College teaching molecular and cellular biology. Uh, she earned her master's in science in entomology from UCD in 2017. So please welcome Patricia. So thank you all very much so for having me here. I'm gonna turn just a little bit so. Hey, so as was stated, I'm from the CDFA, California Department of Food and Agriculture, and I'm the environmental scientist with the Be Safe program. Hey, so a little bit of background with our program. Back in 2012, USDA National Honeybee Health Stakeholder Conference had a report and it was from there that there were a variety of factors that were causing honeybee losses. These included lack of adequate forage, pesticide. Therefore, the CDFA secured one point general funds. Um, 1.5 million of that is going straight to the county agricultural commissioner's offices. Program. Um, our first grant period started with November 15th, 2018, and ran through the end of the fiscal year, which was June 30th, 2019. And right now we're in the middle of our second year of that funding. And so, and I've been with that program since it then started. So the main objectives of the program is to reduce honeybee stress through these four main things that we have up here. Um, so we want to have improved apiary theft prevention efforts decrease apiary pest pressure. Um, for those of you who know honeybees pretty well, there are a variety of different pests that are causing a lot of issues. Um, decreased apiary stress due to pesticide exposure and increased apiary foraging opportunities. 
So our county agricultural commissioners are granted authority identified in our food and agricultural code to enforce various apiary and pest prevention laws. This includes registration, proper identification of hives, um, placement of those hives, inspection and abatement of various pests. And these are intended to ensure the vitality of the beekeeping industry and protect, prevent the introduction into our state with these pests. So, Last year, we had 40 contracts, and so that's with 40 different county agricultural commissioner's offices um, with the CDFA. And this year, in our second year, we have 43 of those now. So I've helped to conduct a variety of trainings because we haven't had really an apiary program in California for 30 years. There's been needing to train a lot of those folks across the various counties. And so back in April 2019, I had six trainings. Um, there were 143 county personnel that showed up from 42 different counties. Um, and if you look at the map there, you can see that I traveled all up and down the state um, giving these trainings. And then just back in October, um, I had an additional five and I had 84 county personal sh personnel show up from 31 counties. So the current focus of the Be Safe program is to encourage communication and education between our county personnel and beekeepers. And that's just what I keep putting emphasis on. You know, we just need to keep talking to the beekeepers. The beekeepers need to talk to us. Uh, the more communication we have between one another, the better off we're all going to be with these pollinator issues. In addition, we're training county personnel on apiary health inspections and promoting consistency in the Bee Safe program activities throughout the state, including our apiary inspections, various notifications, education, and markings. Again, as we all know, California is a really big state, and so that's one of our things, is trying to make sure we're consistent throughout the state. As Peggy mentioned earlier, there's this also this thing called beware. And I know there's been a lot of confusion between be safe and beware. And if you've ever been to a honeybee conference before, there's always like, you know, like bee puns and everything just starts to sound the same. So I'm going to try and clear up the confusion between be safe versus beware. So with beware, it's a real time mapping system where beekeepers can mark hives with a simple pin drop and applicators can access preferences for mandatory 48 hour pesticide notifications during bloom. And so that's what Peggy also mentioned was that mandatory pesticide notification. So. In the past, for the various counties that were doing some apiary work, we used to have a map that, you know, this is just an example of what one might have looked like, these little pins in there to represent where the honeybee hive locations are. And so they would have to, you know, the applicator would call in, be like, I'm going to be planning a spray in this location. They'd have to look and see where that location is, measure a mile around that, and then see if there were any little pins in there to determine whether or not there were any beekeepers that had beehives there, and then get that beekeeper inform information so that the applicator could contact them. Now what there is, is the Beware program, and so this has become computerized. And so you see this nice map that we have on here. The beekeepers can go in, put their little pin drop. The applicators can go in, um, indicate they're going to be spraying this site. It'll do a mile radius around there. And then they'll be like, oh, okay, I know there's you know, beekeepers that have beehives in that area. I do want to emphasize, though, that the applicators and the pest control advisors never get the exact information of where those beehives are located. Um, that is all private information in California. Okay, so now I have this kind of confusing graphic, so just give me a moment to go through it. Okay, here in the middle, we have Beware, and this is our secure and confidential apiary registry. Um, unlike other states, California has a lot of protections for the locations of beekeepers beehives. And so no one outside of CDFA and the County Agricultural Commissioner's Office can have access to that information. It's private. And so this is a secure database then. In order to have information go into that database, there's a variety of different ways. One is through our CalAg permits, where a beekeeper could go, log in themselves, create an account, and put where that hive location is. Or you could contact, the beekeeper could contact the county local agricultural commissioner's place, and they could input that information. Or... Recently, what just um, 
started is this B check app um, that's in collaboration with Fieldwatch. And you could essentially just use your cell phone then, go out to your field, you like GPS location, this is where the hive is. And so there's a variety of different ways of how that information gets inputted into Beware. Then once it's in there, there's various B check reports. These reports are either done by our pest control advisors or by the applicators. And I'll get into that a little bit more too. And so those folks could go into their CalAg permits account, be like, this is the site that I'm looking at. It would look at a one mile radius and they would come back whether or not there's beehives in that area. They could also contact the local county agricultural commissioner's place. And eventually there's going to be additional collaboration with Agrian and CDMS. Hey, so short timeline here. Recently, we had that AB 2468, which clarified some of our current regulations. Um, you know, again, it's unlawful to not register bees. This is something that has been in the code for decades, um, but this helped to clarify it a little bit more. In 2020, we had that field watch app, that bee check that I just mentioned in the last slide. And then in 2021, the county agricultural commissioner's offices can assess civil penalties for violations, and this includes the annual registration. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, the markings of beehives and apiaries with required contact information, and notification of relocations of colonies within 72 hours. And so really our 2020 is our trying to get everyone into compliance and follow what the law says before there's going to start to be those penalties. So next thing I'm going to talk about is the B check for applicators. Again, this is something that Peggy had already mentioned. Um, applicators and growers intending to apply any pesticide labeled toxic to bees to a blossoming plant shall prior to the application, inquire of the commissioner or of a notification service designated by the commissioner, AKA beware, whether any beekeeper with apiaries within one mile of the application site has requested notice of such application. So lots of words there. It's up to the beekeeper whether or not they wanna be notified about the pesticide. They could choose not to be notified if they so desire. So. With this, if the um, beekeeper does want to be notified, the applicator is then to tell the beekeeper the time and place the application is to be made, the crop and acreage to be treated, the method of application, the particular pesticide and dosage rate of the pesticide to be applied, and contact information in case the beekeeper needs to communicate prior to application. And this is all important because you know the beekeeper might be like, okay, if it's this pesticide, it's going to be an issue. But if it's you know this pesticide, it's not going to be as big of an issue. So they need all of this information in order to make their decision of potentially moving that beehive in case of that spray. And again, this has to be done 48 hours before the spray happens. So how this ends up coming out on Beware, we have our applicator, they'll go in, they'll fill out this information, and then down here, they'll see how, which beekeepers have beehives within that one mile radius. In this little example here, we have three different beekeepers and the location of their hives didn't come up. It just comes up with the beekeeper's name and their preferred method of contact. This way, the applicator can then go contact that beekeeper and be like, hey, I'm doing the spray site. You need to know all of this information. There's also a voluntary bee check for our pest control advisors. And so they get a little bit less information. They'll go in, fill in the same information into the beware program, and then it'll pop up just the pure number of beehives within a one mile radius. Um, so they won't get which beekeepers are there. They won't get any of the beekeepers information. It'll just be that there's X number of hives within a one mile radius. And then the PCA could take that in consideration of like, oh, you know what? There's a lot of beehives here. Maybe I shouldn't use this pesticide and maybe I should use a bee safe one. And so that's something that they can use while making those recommendations for the applicators. 
Um, our results tallied so far for 2019 um, with Beware show that we had over 900,000 registered colonies, um, which I'm considering that to be a pretty successful year, um, considering that the USDA report shows that there were probably about 1.6 million honeybee colonies um, in February last year. And so we got probably about half of them, which for our first year I think is really great. And I imagine we'll get a lot higher here in 2020 now as we're getting even more information out there. We also had over 2,000 beekeepers registered. Um, we had 96 PCA bee check reports, 664 grower bee check reports, and 6,053 applicator bee check reports. And so a lot of people are starting to, you know, pay attention to our pollinators. Okay. And if you're still a little bit confused between be safe versus beware, hopefully this will help to clear it up. Be safe is a CDFA, California Department of Food and Agricultural Program, and I'm the environmental scientist for that. And it's funded by the CDFA, and it's funds that then go out to the county agricultural commissioner's offices to fund various apiary-related work by county personnel. Versus Beware is really more of this software program, and it's a collaborative project that's supported by those various 17 different organizations that include DPR, CDFA, and so forth. And its purpose is a mechanism for beekeepers to register their bees and notify the California County Agricultural Commissioner's offices of relocation of movement so that when they move their beehive, we know where it is in case of that pesticide spray again. And it's a mechanism for both applicators and for pest control advisors um, to do bee checks. Okay, I'm gonna try and run through this here real fast. There's a variety of different things that beekeepers need to do if they have bees here in California. Um, the first is that all apiaries in California have to be registered within 30 days of the first of the year or sorry, um, they have to be registered on the first day of the year or within 30 days of entering the state. Um, the registration needs to be filled out with your local county agricultural commissioner's office. There's a $10 registration fee for the beekeeper that has to be paid to them. Um, the hives have to be properly identified and beekeepers must maintain active locations, uh, um, providing an update to the county agricultural commissioner through beware or through a phone call. And in addition, your county or your city could have additional ordinances, and that's something for you to pay attention to. Okay. So real fast with the hive identification, this is an example of what needs to be on there. They have to be identified by either a sign at the front of the apiary, if there's an obvious front of the apiary, or they have to have this on the stenciled on the hive body itself. And that has to be the name of the beekeeper of the business, the city and state that they live in, and their phone number. And so this is an example of what it could look like. And so if we have a obvious front of the apiary, they could just have a sign with that information. Or if they're in pollination and they're on pallet, we'd want that on one per pallet. And so in this case, these ones would not be in compliance, but these ones would be, because it could be any beekeepers, you know, pallet next to another pallet, depending upon how many beekeepers are in the same grow for pollination. Hey, and we'll do questions at the end, but thank you very much. Hopefully that wasn't too much information in a short period of time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. Uh, so we've heard the perspectives of a couple of state agencies, CDP, CDPR and CDFA, and now we're going to hear from Tim Pelican, who's the Ag Commissioner in San Joaquin County. Tim is also the president this year of the State Association of Ag Commissioners and has done a lot of great work with our department and other departments of state government. He's worked in Tuolumne and Stanislaus County and has been now the commissioner since October of 14 in San Joaquin. Tim, good to see you. <clears throat> Thanks, Val. And <clears throat> in case you're wondering, I don't have a PowerPoint because you're not really missing much if you've seen my PowerPoints. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but they asked me to kind of tell, tie all this together and let you know how it really works. Um, one of the things, I'm going to add one other thing. You didn't, you missed be aware, which was a DPR program. Uh, that we were actually in San Joaquin County, we're one of the first that uh, they rolled that out in, and, and uh, we've been involved uh, with apiary uh, pollinator issues ever since. So back when I first 
was, was still in a, another county, uh, we started doing uh, things called um, colony strength inspections. So what colony strength inspections are is, is we get a request from say an almond grower that says, hey, I've got these hives and I don't really think there's as many active frames in these hives as, as we think there were. And until that time, we hadn't really had any sort of active program for many years uh, at, at the county level. And so we would go out and we would open the bee boxes and take a count and see how many active frames there were and let the grower know sometimes they were great, sometimes we would find them empty. And uh, that's always an issue for, the, for, the, for both parties. But from there, it kind of got my interest going when I became a commissioner in San Joaquin County about how we can kind of get the word out for, for the importance of pollinators and uh, what we need to do to help protect them. And, and like I said, we got, aware, we got involved with Be Aware. Uh, we have had at our continuing education uh, classes every year, at least one beekeeper or somebody dealing with pollinators every year. Uh, we've been trying to stress to our growers to not apply any kind of tank spray during pollination season and, unless it's nighttime. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, uh, bee labels and things like that, but the reality of it is, is that what they're finding is, you know, when they're going out early in the spring during bloom, they might be applying fungicides or even fertilizers or whatever that may be, but that also kind of messes with the bee's breathing apparatus. So when they're active, say it's 60 degrees typically, is when they become more active and, and that's when uh, we don't want them spraying. So we try to get them to spray at night. But despite all of our trials and tribulations in terms of trying to make this happen, one of the issues that we've always had is with notification. Uh, beekeepers weren't registering uh, PCAs and uh, pesticide applicators weren't asking us uh, where locations were. As you can see, that actually that uh, that slide with the uh, uh, pins that was that was my county. And actually, I think I took that picture with my phone. Actually, but uh, just to kind of give you an idea, uh, that particular year we typically had, get about. 260,000 hives in San Joaquin County every year for pollination. And we were getting maybe 15 beekeepers and made maybe 2,000 hives registered. So that lets you know what really happens out in the field. So we've been going out since then and trying to let people know that, hey, that's not what you're supposed to do. And one of the things that we'd get from beekeepers is like, why are you guys coming out and regulating us now you never have before? Well, before it consisted of if, if a beekeeper didn't register with the county, the only way to, to have any regulatory authority was to go to the attorney general of the state of California. The attorney general of the state of California does not have time to chase down a beekeeper for a thousand dollar fine. So one of the things that we looked at as commissioners was we needed a tool to kind of put some teeth behind some of the regulations that were in place. We worked on AB 2468 and along with that we, we talked with uh, people from uh, CAPCA regarding some of the issues they were having uh, with, uh, with their uh, applicators that were applying and, and getting uh, turned in for bee kills. Well, one of the issues, like I was saying, is people aren't registering. So a lot of times what would happen is we would we'd get a call and say, hey, we've got a bee kill over here because there was an application taking place. So we would go out and we would see that there were bees there, obviously, and there was an application taking place. So we go and check and make sure everything was done according to label. But when it comes down to it, that beekeeper hadn't registered. So there was no way to inform them whether or not there were, was gonna be an application taking place. So all we could look at was, was the, this application done according to label and according to regulation? And most often it was, so there was no recourse there for the beekeeper, as well as you know this 
an applicator out there saying, well, I, I killed all these bees, but I didn't even know they were there. So that's kind of what started all this. So with 2468, it gives us the ability to, to find both applicators as well as uh, uh, beekeepers if they don't register. And, and uh, we we started working with, in partnership with CAPCA, with the Almond Board, uh, DPR, CDFA. Um, and it was really a, a great project to develop this program because you had this unusual mix of private industry and regulators working together for the benefit of our pollinators. And as that program evolved, it was a long process. Ruben Arroyo's here. He, he helped a lot with that program. He's a, a, a fellow commissioner. And, and myself and a couple other people all put, spent a lot of time on helping develop this program. And uh, it's still not done yet. We're working in, in uh, conjunction with, with uh, Field Watch, which is an out-of-state uh, agent group that uh, had already a program in place, but we had to, to modify that because the, re the regulations in California are quite a bit different than they are in other parts of the, of the United States, where we're required to keep that information private. And in other states, that's not the case. So when we started working with Field Watch, we had to take that into consideration. And, and now uh, one of the things that we're doing help because of uh, Be Safe is that we have the ability to go out now and check beehives when they're coming into the, into the field. And what most people don't realize is that when you see all these big semis going down 99 and I-5 that are covered and full of bee boxes. What happens generally this time of year is all those trucks will go to a drop-off point. And that's where everything is staged for maybe in the entire county or could be for bees that are going all over the valley. And, and so what we would see is these bees would be dropped off. Uh, we'd have no idea who they belong to. Uh, some of it is, uh, you know, some people are take those hives and they rent them out to other people so they could start in say Fresno County and end up in Butte County. So we needed a way to kind of keep track of, of where these bees are and where they're going. So that uh, really has helped us a lot. But in terms of bee safe, uh, it allows our, uh, our biologists to go out and, and check those, those bee boxes to make sure they're marked, uh, to make sure that there's no diseases. Um, to make sure they're registered. One of the things we're doing locally is when I, I have my biologist go out and if those, if the beekeeper isn't registered, I have them fill out the paperwork in the field and, and bring that back and get it entered into beware. The same thing if a, bee, if a beekeeper doesn't have a computer and they wanna come in and register, they register at our front office, we enter that into beware. So uh, it's, and the other part of that is, as commissioners, we're required by law to register those beekeepers. So if there's somebody out there and says, hey, a, a commissioner's not doing that, you know, contact myself if you want. I don't care. We can contact them and let them know that, that hey, you know, it's really your duty to make sure that these bees are, um, bees are um, registered. And the other part of what we're doing too is we're working directly with local law enforcement. Uh, one of the things that would happen in the past is when people start moving bees out, uh, the uh, sheriff's department would call us and say, hey, do you know who these bees belong to? And there was no way I could tell them who these bees belong. But bee, bee theft is a huge issue. Uh, if, if you remember back a couple years ago in Fresno County, there was a million dollars worth of bees down there that were, that were stolen out of fields. So with that, I just kind of wanted to give you an overall view of what the commissioners are doing and what we do and uh, our place in this whole uh, pollinator issue that's going on today. So. Tim, thank you very much. So we've heard the perspective of government agencies. We've heard the perspective of the state and now county government. And I think Tim really hit on an important theme, which is the public-private partnership when it comes to 
protecting pollinators, but to that I would add nonprofit organizations. And so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my former colleague from the Pollinator Partnership, Kelly Rourke. Kelly is the Director of Programs and Operations at P2, as we call it. Uh, she grew up in upstate New York, now lives in San Francisco, was educated at UC Santa Cruz and the University of San Francisco. So Kelly, it's a pleasure to have you here. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Uh, I wanna thank Paul and Val for organizing and, and inviting and the great presenters that spoke previously who set the scene for um, what I'm gonna finish up with today for this uh, event. So, um, Here's a little bit of an agenda. I know we don't have much time, so I'm gonna really blaze through this. Um, I wanna first start by talking to you a little bit about Pollinator Partnership, my organization, and what we do, and kind of our approach to pollinator protection. So our mission is to promote the health of pollinators critical to food and ecosystems. We do this through firsthand research, scientific research across many different landscapes and issues. We do this by creating habitat. We have many restoration programs that we work with, um, seed collection networks, we do gardens, small scale, large scale restoration efforts as well. We promote stewardship. So we like to recognize people that are doing good work for pollinators, showcasing them and giving them recognition for the great work that they're doing. We also convene all parties. So one of our, our main things that we like to do is bring all people to the table to discuss the current issues, um, the accurate science, and the you know brainstorming to help protect pollinators. We also do a bit of policy work. So we um, do a little bit of lobbying in Washington, D.C. We try to um, influence acts and policies like the Farm Bill to um, provide more funding for pollinator programs. We also do a good deal of education and outreach. So as you heard earlier, someone mentioned the National Pollinator Week, which takes place in June of each year. And that's a really fun way for people to get mobilized and celebrate uh, pollinators and all they provide to us. And we do this through the lens and the mission of protecting all pollinators. So we worked with managed pollinators like honeybees, bumblebees, as well as all those that that Val spoke of earlier. So pesticide education. We have a few um, handouts I left in the back. Um, the one on your left is actually for home gardens and teaching people about how to do safe practices in your own landscape um, if you do feel that you need to use uh, a pesticide or some sort of insecticide to uh, manage your own garden. We also have a pesticide applicators for sure in the back as well um, that covers a lot of the kind of topics and programs that we and resources that we heard of earlier. We also have a pretty extensive guide that um, is about reducing bee poisoning from agricultural pesticides. Um, we are a North American scoped organization so we have one for Canada as well as the United States and these are all available at pollinator.org. So one of the main educational resources I want to cover today is um, a protecting pollinators training module. And this is a training module for certified pesticide applicators, other applicators and crop advisors. It covers the importance of, current, importance of and the current status of pollinators, how professional applicators can help protect pollinators, how to select pesticides and applications that control the target pest with mini minimal risk to pollinators, and the importance of labels and label language. So this training module will help you increase your skill in minimizing the effects of pesticide applicators on pollinators. It's, it's done in three parts. So there's a workbook, a PowerPoint, and a video. It is meant to be conducted in a classroom setting, and it includes teacher key and participant evaluations as well. And this was reviewed by all stakeholder groups as we tend to convene all parties. And it was um, supported by diverse funding sources. So the workbook, which is available um, download online, as well as print copy, as well as on a thumb drive, um, is 36 pages. Again, it goes over the importance of pollinators, specific best practices and references, 
It gives professionals the tools they need for prevention of pollinator problems. And it really, a kind of central theme of this whole module is to increase cooperation and understanding between applicators, farmers, and beekeepers. We also have a PowerPoint that is um, meant for the instructor to go through along with the workbook. It includes cues for, for discussion points and topics to discuss, kind of hard hitting questions, and checkbacks to make sure people are following along and understanding. It can also be customized and truncated as well to fit your needs or the audience's needs. And this was actually created by our North American Pollinator Protection Campaign, or NAPSI, which is on the little half sheet. Um, it was created by the Pesticide Task Force, which I'll go into a little bit later. And the third component of this module is the video, which was, it, it has real people and real information in it. So we actually um, use uh, the voice of the applicator and interview them, interview the farmer and beekeepers as well. So you're really learning firsthand from the people that are, are involved in all this, these processes. And it shows the action taking place and it's pretty memorable and short. It's only 14 minutes, so it's quite digestible. Um, and again, this full module is available on pollinator.org. So another program of pollinator partnership I want to talk about is called Bee Friendly Farming. And this is a program that provides guidelines for farmers and growers interested in promoting pollinator health on their lands. It's a self-certification program. It's manageable and cost-effective for farmers. It showcases good stewardship and provides recognition and consumer preference to members. We also have a lot of outreach materials, signs and hats um, that you can, that farmers can use, producers can use and um, showcase your involvement in the program. So we do have some criteria that um, is required to meet before you can be involved in the program. So I'll quickly run through this. Uh, you have to offer forage providing good nutrition for bees on at least 3% of your land. Provide bloom of different flowering plants throughout the growing season. Offer clean water for bees. Provide habitat for nesting through features such as hedgerows, natural brush, or buffer strips. So these are for the native bees that, were, that are on the landscape as well. Number five here obviously pertains to this talk is practicing integrated pest management by reducing or eliminating the use of pesticides. We do have an annual certification fee of $45, so as I mentioned, pretty uh, nominal. And we actually recently instated a seventh criteria, which is to complete a compliance form every three years, which is audited by our task force. So we have a really interactive website for this program on pollinator.org. It has a map where you can meet all the farms that are um, involved in the program. You can actually click on those dots, go to their website, see where they are. We have nearly 800 farms enrolled in eight countries. Um, and this is a wide variety of crop producers, small and large scale operations as well. So uh, I, in the last section here, I want to go into some next steps for a pollinator partnership. So we are now looking at crop specific guidelines for our bee friendly farming program. We're actually just entered into an expanded partnership with the Almond Board of California. And we're working with the Almond Board um, and their California Almond Sustainability Program or CASP, which I, we heard about a little bit earlier. Um, we're integrating our Bee Friendly Farming criteria with ABC's Bee Health module. We're looking at potentially modifying some of the Bee Friendly Farming criteria based on water restrictions, land coverage, bloom period, all of which can be um, a little bit of a sticking point for some of the almond producers. We're realizing, you know, this program, while great and accessible, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. So we're really trying to meet people where they are and crop specific and industry specific standards can be a way to do that. And the goal of our um, almond board uh, partnership is to increase the number of almond farmers providing pollinator habitat on their lands. So just a little bit more on the crop specific guidelines. Um, some other crops of interest in California that we've started to work with the commodity groups or commissions are uh, table grapes, wine grapes, strawberries, blueberries. That's just a few. And we actually are also tapping into some other industries like solar farms, cannabis, and forestry. 
Many of these also have their own certifications like CASP does in Almond, and we're trying to see how we can fit in and help bolster the good work for pollinators through those certifications as well. And then um, I mentioned earlier the Nor North American Pollinator Protection Campaign, or NAPSI as we call it. We're entering into our 20th anniversary year in 2020. It's a very exciting time for us. Um, we have an annual meeting in Washington, D.C. each year. It's in October. And this is a collaboration of over 170 partner organizations, government agencies, state agencies, NGOs, industry professionals, commodity groups, beekeepers, farmers, volunteers, conservationists, you name it. Anyone's involved and invited. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we do have these task forces, one for pesticide education, one for bee-friendly farming, but we also, ha also have nine others on other issues like monarch butterflies, um, rights of way, things like that. So we do have our NAPSI Pesticide Task Force, um, which their objective is to determine how pesticide registration and regulation can be used as a tool to protect and promote pollinator health. So we do this through progress over perfection, cooperation and consensus, and um, there are, you know, bringing all, all parties to the table, such are listed in the, in the participant list right there. And I will end with that. Thank you very much for listening today. And my um, email is there if you have any questions.